The Yamaha R6 arrives at our shootout without a significant redesign since the 2008 model year. And yet, the R6 still looks racy, and its exhilarating road performance proves just how competitive the middleweight sport bike class has become. The R6 now has the distinction of being the oldest platform in this test, next to the Ducatis. And the bike still rips, man. Like, it's still got a good amount of torque. For an inline four with its YCCI, its variable intact tracks, you would think it's just marketing hype, but it works. It works really well. When you get that thing zinging at 10,000 RPM, the thing launches forward. It's got a lot of mid-range torque for an inline four engine. R6, like the Ducati, I think it's one of the more track-oriented bikes. Uh, I liked it on the racetrack up at Chuckwalla, but on the street, it feels a little bit too harsh for me. Um, it's still a real good all-around bike. Hasn't changed that much in, in many years, but uh, you know, I think it's starting to maybe show its age a little bit on the street compared to some of these newer rides. It's a great bike, light and nimble, but it does have a little bit of characteristic of when you first sit on the bike, the fairings are really, really wide. It kind of gives the illusion um, that the bike is a little bit bigger body work and a little bit heavier. Not the case. Um, it definitely needs the suspension work done for you. It's got to go and have a setup done. So I'd recommend on that bike, definitely go get the sag um, dialed in for your liking. It needs some upgrades in terms of handling a little bit more versatile engine um, for it to better keep pace with the more contemporary motorcycles from uh, Kawasaki and Triumph. It lacked for me a little bit in the power department amongst all the rest. Um, I think it's ready for, for a facelift as well. It's uh, The bodywork is, is kind of looking a little bit dated to me. Um, overall, fun bike to ride though. Uh, I'd recommend it to my friends. <laughs> I'm just really excited for Yamaha to unveil their, their replacement for that bike. Again, the R6 is not a bad bike by any means, but it just, it is just a little bit long in the tooth as compared to the other motorcycles in this, in this group. While it finished last on the score sheet, the R6 is a formidable package and a testament to the Super Sport class's performance capabilities. The Yamaha suffers on the street from being the more track biased of the 600s, but it's also the most affordable. At just under $11,000 as tested, the R6 may finish last, but is arguably the best value in its class. The MV Augusta teases with its sultry lines and Italian styling. Powered by a 675cc inline triple, the MV is the Triumph Daytona's doppelganger. But can the new sleek looking Italian match the tried and true British brawler on the street? The MV Augusta, that bike is crazy. Uh, crazy in a good way, but crazy in a couple bad ways too. Um, it has a fly-by-wire throttle and it needs a little bit more tuning and some refinement. When you let off the gas, it's not ready yet. It still wants to party, even though I've tried to cancel it. We let off the throttle going in the corners and it keeps feeding the engine gas, which is nice because it gives it a good freewheeling effect, kind of like a two-stroke, but you gotta be ready for it. When you're not ready for it, you're like, oh my God, I'm coming in the corner all hot, and the thing keeps going. Like, it's almost like ghost in the machine status. So coming in the corners, it didn't feel like it settled as good as some of the other Japanese bikes. Um, and the throttle response was kind of, kind of light switchy for me. It would, uh, it would take a long time for it to come on, and once it came on, it came on hard. I mean, for an experienced rider, it's kind of fun and ha, 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 ha. But if you're like a new rider or like someone who doesn't ride sport bikes a lot, it's kind of sketchy, man, I'm not gonna lie. At the same time, that's what kind of makes this motorcycle cool. You get that thing wailing on the pipe and the engine sounds like it's gonna explode. There's no sound like any other bike that comes from the MV. It inspires you to go faster and to keep kind of charging through its problems. Wicked sound, those pipes sound so great, especially when you're on it in a flat, in a, in a straight line. Pipes just sort of so good, so good. The thing's got a quick shifter now, so you're just like grabbing gears like instantaneously without letting off the throttle. And like, it just does it for me. Like, it just sounds so badass. It looks cool. Um, it's surprisingly comfortable ergonomically. I actually like the ergonomics. But at the same time, the suspension calibration is so kind of not balanced that it really beats you up on the road. Great in straight lines, power for days. Um, but for me, the handling wasn't quite there. The MV Agusta F3. I was waiting to ride that bike all day. Once I got on it, I wanted to get right off. 
between the bike wallowing, going into turns and rolling up the gas, and then the, and the, the sketchy throttle, it really sapped all my confidence once I got on that bike. And it's a shame because the looks and the sound of it is, is by far probably the best in the, in, the, in the group. But from what I felt from it, the feedback I got from the bike, definitely it's, you know, two thumbs down on that. I like the power that it delivers, but it does have some, some issues with the fueling, I've noticed, some weird throttle delivery at times. Uh, it's just not quite dialed in. It's one of those bikes that I think will get better as it gets developed more. They just need a little bit of refinement. This bike could be right atop the, the group if they could dial those things in. The MV Augusta F3 left us wondering what if. The engine character, particularly the exhaust note, is phenomenal. But the F3 is plagued by electronics and fueling woes, holding it back, but enticing us as well. Once they get the engine mapping dialed, this F3 will be a major contender. The Ducati 848 Evo stands apart in the super sport field with its growling L-twin. This year, the 848 comes in an Evo SE spec with an up-spec Olin shock and larger fuel load. It's a racy platform that delivers track-worthy performance, but how well does it hold up as a street bike? Ducatis have always been one of my favorite bikes. I mean, looks-wise, in my opinion, they, they look the best. It's nice, it's refined, it's fun bike to ride in the canyons. You can take it to coffee, you can roll it down sunset. I mean, it looks good picking up a chick on a date. It's just a great motorcycle. What a great bike. If any part of it, though, does need a little bit help in the motor department. It kind of falls flat on its face at the top. Kind of expected out of a V-twin, but we're really not seeing a bunch of grunt off of the bottom and some of the inline bikes that the Japanese are coming out with, they really stepped up their game in that, in that horsepower and torque curve. So it's pretty close, and um, I would say Ducati needs to do something and get that horsepower up a little bit. You really have to ride it different. Like, you gotta keep that thing zinging on the pipe, and it's not easy. Shifting gears all the time on it, always shifting gears, and uh, fortunately it has an electronic quick shifter, which definitely helps it on the, on the upshift phase, but it doesn't have a slipper clutch on the downshift phase, so, um, the rear end has got more pe propensity to m move around and upset the chassis. I think it's the most track-oriented bike, which hurts it a lot on the street. Uh, it's the least comfortable. Uh, the ergonomics, you reach forward, you stretch out. The seat's not very comfortable. It's also got really strong, powerful brakes, but they're a little bit grabby on the street. Ducati's brakes, they definitely have that figured out. The Brembo's, super powerful. The initial grip, the initial bite, it's a little grabby. It definitely inspires, uh, inspires confidence in the brakes, so you can kind of run it in a little bit deeper, carry the mid-corner speed. Uh, you really sit in the pocket on that bike. The only other complaint with the Ducati is you get a lot of heat coming from that underseat exhaust. Doesn't look like there's much heat shielding underneath there, and you basically have about a two-inch piece of foam between you and a hot mid-pipe. So again, doing a lot of commuting, um, might not be the best option. Ducati's a fun bike, certainly it's a fun bike to ride, but it just requires so much extra effort, and so much extra attention, that it almost kind of takes away from the ride. The 848 continues to stand out from the super sport crowd with its distinctive character and definite performance boost from its largest displacement engine. But it also presents unyielding ergonomics as a street bike, not to mention a premium price tag, slotting the Ducati in fifth in our 2013 street shootout rankings. Last redesigned in 2011, the Suzuki GSX-R600 arrives at this year's street shootout, the defending champion. Featuring top shelf components and a street friendly ergonomics package, the Jixxer faces a revitalized field of super sport competitors. Everyone knows if you've watched these videos or read any of the reviews over the last years, I love Suzuki GSX-Rs, I totally love them. Yes, I love them, I love them, I love them. And the Jixxer 600, again, totally impressed the crap out of me. That bike's got heritage and a long history behind it. Got a lot of the bugs worked out. That is a really refined bike. Though it is kind of, uh, it doesn't do anything special. It kind of gets, you know, like an A minus across the board. Probably the smoothest power band out of all of them. Uh, coming into a corner and kind of keeping the throttle on halfway and then powering out, it didn't lurch or, or, or hiccup at all. It was right there and you rolled the power on and you felt it come on. It was great. Suzuki, like the Honda, like the Yamaha, it, it feels very similar. They're all, all very similar, but I think the Suzuki 600 is maybe the most comfortable for the street. It does feel good. It actually inspires a lot of confidence in the turns. It's pretty stable, uh, good power, mid-range. 
but I think it is a good base for a uh, 600 bike, maybe somebody that wants to race or a good canyon bike. It's so easy to ride for me. Like I, I just know exactly what it's gonna do. Like if the bike, I can hop on and within 30 seconds, I'm already doing wheelies and slides on it because like it's, 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 I just know how it's gonna respond every time. It's maybe not as fast as some of the other bikes, but it's still got a good amount of mid-range. Like it still pulls hard. It sounds cool, it's got a good character, it's got a big, 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 loud air induction sound. I really like that you can adjust the position of the foot pegs. You can lower them, and, uh, and that just makes it more comfortable for a car guy to ride in the street. The Gixxer 600, it might end up being a middle of the pack bike. That's not a bad thing. That bike does everything really well. Um, it's easy to ride. Got a lot of over rev on that bike. I definitely like that. The one problem with the 600 is it really, I think it's sort of out, overshadowed by the Gixxer 750, which is just like the Gixxer 600, but more powerful. So it, it, it sort of suffers from that, I think. Overall, if you're just looking for like a really, really just good all around street bike, the Gixxer 600 is it. The GSXR 600 still impresses as an easy to ride platform with more than enough performance on the street. It does nothing wrong, but drops in the rankings because of increased competition. Despite the demotion, the Gixxer remains a potent and popular super sport option, and for good reason.